What's up, Dat Project family? I am your co-host, Rhonda Elizabeth. And look, I am free out here in these DC, DC streets here on 14th and U Street. Now, for our book club, TDPB Reading, we read Chocolate City, a history of race and democracy in the nation's capital. Now, what we learned was that DC was actually a site of a lot of black power movement activity. And lucky for us, we get to be joined by one of the co-authors, G. Derek Musgrove, who's going to give us a walking tour of some of those locations. So join us on this tour, listen to the podcast, learn more about black power activism here in the district, and then make sure you get your copy of this wonderful book from an independent bookstore. And remember, resistance is a highway with many lanes, and we hope you find yours. Peace. Hey, so where are we? So we're at the corner of 14th and U Street, uh, mm -hmm. right in the heart of Washington, D.C., uh, mm -hmm. Northwest. Yep. And for most of the 20th century, this was the center of the black community in the city. Mm -hmm. At that corner uh, is really important for, well, in fact, this, this corner is important for most of 20th century D.C. history. <laughs> One but, corner. But yeah, this is, I mean, this is the heart of, this is the heart of um, Shaw to the south, Columbia uh -huh. Heights to the north, Adams Morgan over to uh, the um, west. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you really got a, a lot of black people living in this area in the middle of the 20th century. Like how many? Um, goodness, the black community at, at, at the midpoint in the 20th century, so like 1940, before you get a really big burst of people coming uh, during and after World War II, mm -hmm. is about 190,000 people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The next 20 years, though, you get 200,000 more people. More uh, black people? More black people only. That's right? a lot of people. Um, and many of them come here, not all of them. There's, there's black mm -hmm. communities on the east of the city in Deanwood and Anacostia, uh, Hillsdale. Uh, you know, there's, there's black communities all, all around, but, but Shaw is the largest concentration of African-Americans uh, in the city uh, mm -hmm. for most of the 20th century. Um, and it, it encompasses, I should point out, like a lot of different black areas from LaDroit Park uh, in the east uh, over to the edge of DuPont Circle in the west, all the way down to uh, the center city in the south. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, this, this sort of ends up being the center and, and the main commercial strip. And something really significant happened at this particular intersection, right? Yes, a lot of significant things. A lot of protests yeah. happened here, but, but the one that we're going to talk about now is the 1968 uh, revolt. Mm -hmm. uh, so April of 1968, Martin, Martin Luther King is assassinated in Memphis. Mm -hmm. um, and Stokely Carmichael, uh, who was the leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, is in the office the, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which is right up 14th Street mm -hmm. on the left-hand side, about two blocks up. Mm -hmm. uh, and he heads out here with a couple other activists and begins walking up and down U Street, demanding that um, uh, the people who own the businesses here, many of them are white, mm -hmm. uh, demanding that they close down in honor of Martin Luther King's assassination. They had done so in honor of JFK's assassination in 1963. Mm -hmm. And so he demanded the same for you know, a person who he saw as sort of one of the preeminent leaders of black America. And did they comply? Did they shut Most everything Most of them down? did. I mean, mm -hmm. straight away they did. Um, because it was Stokely Carmichael or because they honored MLK? Both, actually. Because uh, if Stokely uh, Carmichael told me to do something, you know, we would probably come to an understanding and I would do it. <laughs> so, so it was both. I mean, one is that Stokely Carmichael was followed increasingly by dozens and then uh, 50 and then 100 people. And they were obviously angry and upset. Uh, and so store owners were thinking, you know, I don't want any trouble. But also large numbers of them were relatively liberal Jewish store owners. Um, and they favored the, the nonviolent integrationist aspect of the civil rights movement. And so they were glad to close down in honor of Martin Luther King, right? They, like, they knew that this was a really tragic moment. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, um, as Stokely Carmichael's walking up and down the street and the crowd's getting bigger and bigger, mm -hmm. um, uh, it starts to get out of hand. Uh, and the imagine. first time that a window is broken, a large plate glass window, is right on that corner at the People's Drug Store. People's Drug Store was like CVS is today. There was one right. in sort of every neighborhood. Um, and there was a large plate glass window there. People's Drug, it was really famous in the black community as being one of those businesses that refused to hire black people during the Great Depression mm -hmm. when people were, were pushing a don't buy where you work campaign. Mm -hmm. And once that young man uh, broke that plate glass window, all hell started to break loose. People started breaking other plate glass windows. People started throwing trash cans. Um, mm -hmm. And eventually you had a revolt. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Stokely Carmichael, who realized that he was in danger of, of being sort of 
fingered as the person who had started this, even though he tried to sort of calm people down, uh, jumps in a car and, and leaves the area. But within about an hour or two, things were out of hand. Uh, and, and this area was, was beginning to uh, go up in flames. How do we get from that point of the riot and abandonment to where we are today? Yeah, so that process actually happens in phases. Um, so initially, um, after the 1968 uh, revolt, it's four days uh, it, uh, of, of revolt, and DC actually has the worst fire damage of any city uh, that has a major revolt, largely because there's a group of uh, young men who called themselves the Zulus. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't know where their headquarters is. We don't even know most of their names, but mm -hmm. they gave interviews to the Washington Post oh. back in 1968, 1969. Mm -hmm. And they were interested in accelerating what they saw as sort of a disorganized riot into a full, a full on rebellion. And mm -hmm. so the way that they thought that that would happen is that they drove around with a car with a trunk, trunk full of gasoline and bottles. And every time someone looted a store, they'd toss a Molotov cocktail into the store from the back. And so DC had the worst fire damage of any city uh, uh, in any of the riots, including ones where like a lot of stuff got burnt down, like Detroit and Newark, right? Mm -hmm. And that was because of their activities. It was sort of systematic arson. Other people were burning stuff too, but they really accelerated the process. Literally. Yeah. Um, so after that happens, it takes about four days in, in the largest uh, uh, sort of per capita uh, mobilization of National Guard troops of any of the, the rebellions of the late 60s, early 70s to mm -hmm. quell the disturbances. After that, pretty much all of the white business owners move out. They head up to Silver Spring or out to Hyattsville or over to Bethesda, and they don't come back. Mm -hmm. And they suck a huge amount of money out of the area when they go. Mm -hmm. Initially, a lot of black businesses actually come in and try to replace those white businesses. So there was a white um, you know, dry cleaner, a black businessman will come in and buy the business and try to run it as a dry cleaner. But it's, it's also like that the people are really kind of not at a point where they're willing to sort of put down the Molotov cocktails and, and put down the bricks. And so what you have are, are a mini riot in 1970. You actually have a mini riot in October 1968, right at this very corner. Uh, largely after a, a, an officer shoots a young man who was jaywalking. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's just constant civil disturbances. Right. Mm -hmm. And the police can't handle them. Uh, and so what happens is that those black businesses really aren't able to establish a customer base. Mm -hmm. um, and so eventually this, this initial burst of black investment, which is relatively small, um, kind of fizzles out because they can't make money. Mm -hmm. um, the federal government does not put a lot of money in the area. Local banks do not put a lot of money in the area. And so what you get is that the entire area gets starved of cash. The federal government does come in and clear all the charred buildings and effectively create empty lots, but nobody builds on those empty lots. Mm -hmm. uh, because from a sort of purely financial standpoint, you'd be kind of crazy to build on those lots. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a riot every other year or so after 1968. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you see is that, that nobody comes in and, and, and invests. Uh, and the people who live here don't have the money to do so. The city government does try to spark investment. Marion Barry builds the Reeve Center in 1986 for the specific purpose of trying to spark investment on U Street, mm -hmm. but private capital doesn't come back. Mm -hmm. um, and so you don't get a significant amount of private capital coming into the neighborhood and roughly until the late 90s, early 2000s, after the subway is finished, after the Reeves building has long been established, uh, and they realize that they can make some money building condos, uh, freshening up old buildings, uh, as, the, as the area begins to gentrify. And so this area, which was the center of the riot in the late 1960s, is the center of gentrification in the district in the early 2000s down to today. Whew, that's quite the history. <laughs>